Imagine a world millions of years in the future, where evolution has written a new chapter in the story of life. That was the tagline of The Future is Wild, a miniseries that aired in the early 2000s exploring the speculative life forms of the far future. And it was amazing. I think this show left an impact on a lot of people, myself included. I loved this series, and I think my interest in it helped set me on the path which eventually led to me making this channel. The special effects are, of course, a little dated by today's standards, but the world is fantastically detailed, and an impressive team of real scientists came up with the creatures that inhabit it. And while some of the predictions are pretty out there, people forget the Futures Wild never set out to flawlessly predict future life forms but to get people excited about biology and earth science. And I think these creatures definitely deserve a nostalgic second look, even if you've never heard of them before. So for this extra long entry into the archive, we'll be exploring this hypothetical future, having fun incorporating contemporary scientific discoveries that might provide new insight into these speculative life forms, and just appreciating the richness of the world the series created. So, prepare to jump forward several million years, to the first era of The Future is Wild. The Future is Wild is divided into three eras, set 5 million, 100 million, and 200 million years into the future. Our journey begins in the 5 million year era, when Earth is locked in an ice age. Humans aren't present in this narrative, having either left the planet or long since died out. We'd know this frozen wasteland as northern France, but it's now unrecognizable, buried under sheets of ice over half a mile or one kilometer thick. And stalking this icy tundra is the first life form of the future. This is a snow stalker, a saber-toothed predator searching desperately for a meal. The snow stalker is a grounded speculative life form, and one of my favorites when I was younger. This snow stalker has journeyed all the way from the coast in search of food, and it might have found some in the form of gannet whales. Despite their size, these blubbery beach dwellers are actually aquatic birds, and have come ashore to lay their eggs. Their ancestor is the modern gannet, a bird that can already dive underwater and swim with its wings. The concept of a gannet transitioning to a dolphin-sized animal in just 5 million years is in some ways surprising. It might make more sense, for example, to expect that already aquatic animals like sea lions and penguins would be the ones to evolve into a niche left by whales and their relatives. But we now know better than ever from the fossil record that whales themselves evolved from a rodent-like animal into a large seafaring one remarkably quickly. So gannet whales, though unexpected, aren't impossible. And while a single gannet whale would be a mighty feast for a snow stalker, this group is just too large to be worth the trouble. Further inland, however, another potential source of food is moving across the plains. On the horizon, a herd of shag rats slog their way through the snow. These thick-coated creatures are the descendants of alpine marmots, although the shag rats are over three times larger than their rodent ancestors. And while shag rats look a bit like musk oxen, they aren't much bigger than sheep, so five million years is plenty of time for such a life form to emerge upon the tundra. Yet shag rats aren't big enough to deter a predator like a snow stalker. All it takes is for one of them to fall behind the herd, and the weary snow stalker can at last get its meal. Yet this meal won't just feed one mouth. This particular snow stalker is a mother and is bringing back food for her two cubs. It's a moment that has always stuck out to me, as it shows us that even in the most competitive ecosystems, parental instincts haven't changed. But other ecosystems are even more barren. The scientists imagine that to the south, tectonic and temperature shifts have transformed the Mediterranean Sea into vast salt flats. Dashing along this harsh expanse is a cryptile. These lizards are some of the only creatures that can endure this arid desert, thanks to their clever method of getting moisture. Near pools of brine, enormous swarms of brine flies reproduce and take to the air. These engorged flies are an excellent source of food and water for anything that can catch them. 
and the Cryptile is an expert fly trapper. The lizard rushes through the huge swarm, using its neck frill as a fishing net and licking the trap flies off the net as it runs. It's an extreme concept for a life form, but a believable one. The Cryptile, like a lot of the best life forms in the future is wild, takes numerous unique traits from modern animals, such as frilled lizards and salt lake ground dragons, and combines them into a new, yet still plausible life form. Rising out of the salt, the Mediterranean islands are now mountains of eroded limestone rock. For cryptiles, they make an ideal egg-laying location. Deep fissures in the rock called grikes mark the island's surface, and some of these miniature canyons are narrow enough that they are inaccessible to most predators. But near the larger grikes, a cryptile needs to be on its guard. For there is a predator here, a stealthy Gryken, that takes advantage of the natural cover the Grikes provide. The Gryken's closest ancestor is the Pine Martin, a small predator that today navigates the branches of trees instead of narrow canyons. But five million years is a reasonable stretch of time for a Pine Martin to become a deadly Gryken. Efficient as Grykens are, however, the Cryptile has the advantage of speed. But the Cryptile isn't the preferred prey of the Grykens. Instead, the delicate-looking pigs known as Scrofas are their primary food source. At a glance, it's easy to tell the Scrofas are the descendants of wild boars, but with one distinct change. Scrofa leg bones have become elongated, with the animals now walking on the tips of their toes. It's an adaptation we've documented elsewhere in nature. This hoof design mirrors those of Clipspringer antelopes, which have similar ballet shoe-like hooves to move on rocky outcroppings. So, considering the Scrofa's environment, their strange hoof structure holds up to scientific scrutiny. With pigs this athletic, the Grykens have their work cut out for them in trying to catch one. Further south is one of the regions I remember most distinctly from my childhood. Huge grassy plains stretch across the South American landscape where the Amazon rainforest stood before the Ice Age. And upon this Amazon prairie, a strange troop of ground-dwelling monkeys called Babukaris move through the tall grass. The Babukaris are fairly intelligent, weaving strange basket-like traps and placing them in shallow lakes to catch small fish, which are their primary food source. While this level of tool use in a primate might seem surprising, we now have even more documentation than when this documentary first aired of primates using tools to get to their food. But the monkey the Babukari are theoretically evolved from, the red-faced Bukari, aren't among those that have been documented using basic tools. But no matter their ancestor, the Babukari's existence on the plains is imagined to be quite perilous for the troop is always in danger of being eaten by the mighty Kara Killers, enormous birds that patrol the grasslands in groups. Like the Babukari, the Kara Killers' ancestor is a bit surprising, as they're imagined to have evolved from small falcons in just five million years' time. A larger modern bird like the red-legged Seriyima, whose ancestors, the terror birds, are the real-world inspiration of the Kara Killer, are another potential starting point for these giants. But in either case, Kara Killers, for all their strength, can't do much to a creature like a rattleback. These reptile-like armored omnivores are imagined to have too thick a shell for Kara Killers to break through. Their armor is actually derived from hair, which has become matted and fused into hard scales. This is because the rattleback isn't a reptile at all, but a mammal, imagined to have evolved from a forest-dwelling rodent species. They were another one of my favorites from this era, although admittedly a rodent transitioning into a reptile-like creature that can move its scales independently in just 5 million years would be quite the transformation. But a relative of the rattleback that is closer to its mammalian ancestor dwells in the bleak desert of central North America. In this Ice Age desert, the North American rattleback braves the intense cold. This particular rattleback is a mother traveling with her baby, and they are facing the intense winds of a sandstorm. Luckily, their spines aren't just adapted to deter predators, but also to protect themselves from the unforgiving environment. These creatures are closer to what one might expect to emerge in this evolutionary time frame. 
To find food, the rattlebacks dig underground for tubers. But this mother is unknowingly disturbing the burrow of a highly unusual subterranean life form. This tiny creature is a spink. And although it might not look like it, the spink is a bird. According to the documentary, the spink evolved from quails, near flightless birds that transition to an underground lifestyle. The spink are another creature that seems unusually specialized for just 5 million years of transition. Although we do have documentation of other birds, like bee eaters, digging burrows in which to lay their eggs. But the spink live almost their entire lives in their tunnels, and only come out under cover of darkness. Peculiar as they are, I've always found these tunneling birds strangely adorable. Far less adorable are the creatures that swoop overhead. With wingspans of 4 feet or 1 meter, these predators, called death gleaners, look like giant predatory birds. But these are actually bats, which have evolved to take the spot of apex predators in the North American skies. It would take a very special extinction event for bats to outcompete large North American birds of prey like eagles and condors. But certain modern species of bats, like flying foxes, have already reached similar sizes. So from a biomechanical perspective, given the right opportunity, creatures like the death gleaners could indeed take flight. The documentary then jumps to my personal favorite era of 100 million years into the future. Beginning in the coastal swamps, this is a version of Earth where hot and humid climate conditions have led to a period of tremendous biodiversity. And no species is more emblematic of this era of abundance than the Toraton. These lumbering giants are huge, described as being the largest land animals ever, exceeding the weight of even the biggest dinosaur. So, it's surprising that the ancestor of these creatures is a species of tortoise. Tortoises might not be the most expected life form to break the size record, especially since we now have better research suggesting that large dinosaurs like sauropods could only get so large thanks to their starting advantage of lightweight bone construction. Still, I've always loved the concept of giant tortoises, and other aspects of the Toraton, like legs that have shifted under their body and their swampy environment having a tremendous amount of available plant matter, make a lot of sense considering their size. Near the feet of the Toratons dwell a family of swampus. These excellently named creatures are the descendants of octopuses, and remarkably they can move on land. Strange as that might sound, we now have more documentation than ever of octopuses moving on the land in a limited capacity, using their tentacles to haul themselves along. The Swampus takes this concept further, by being able to breathe above water to some extent, sort of like the strange mud skippers of today. And like the mud skipper, the Swampus spends part of their time in the water, and aren't true land-dwelling cephalopods. Those will come later. For now, every time the Swampus returns to the water, it has to be on high alert. For there is an apex predator here in the murky depths that can feed on the Swampus. This is a lurkfish, a descendant of the catfish that can sense the Swampus's movement thanks to a weak electric field the lurkfish generates. But this terror of the wetland has another use for electricity. Releasing a powerful shock, the lurkfish stuns the Swampus and swallows its meal in a single gulp. While this menacing life form might seem far-fetched, many modern catfish hunt in a manner that is surprisingly similar. Certain breeds of catfish can produce a small shock thanks to specialized muscles on their back, which the catfish uses to stun its prey just like a lurkfish. But it's not just the swamps of this era that the documentary imagines are much changed. Higher global temperatures have caused tremendous sea level rise with many lowland regions now flooded. These vast, shallow seas stretch across the globe and are home to remarkable new life forms. This is an ocean phantom. Always one of my favorites, this complex-looking creature is a unique type of siphonophore. Like modern siphonophores, the ocean phantom is actually composed of numerous different life forms some of which act as sails to help it navigate these seas, others of which help keep the life form afloat, and finally, some which trail below the colony to help it catch food. 
The idea of a life form using biological cells might sound a little out there, but some modern siphonophores and their relatives have already evolved something similar. So, while the ocean phantom is certainly an unusual life form, frankly, so are most modern siphonophores. Under the water's surface, small creatures swim in the shallow current. At a glance, these creatures look like fish, but the scientists imagine they're actually a descendant of the sea slug, or nudibranch. These are reef gliders, and they play a vital role in pollinating the red algae that grows here. Free-swimming sea slugs might have once seemed far-fetched, but the recently filmed Cephalophygy is a nudibranch that has evolved to spend its entire life swimming in the ocean current. So the concept of a fish-like sea slug such as the reef glider isn't so unlikely after all. But the reef gliders are in danger here in the open ocean. For the ocean phantom is a hunter, and is quite adept at snatching up reef gliders and using them to feed the colony. But feeding on reef gliders is a dangerous gambit, for while young reef gliders are small, adults are large enough to pose a serious threat to the soft ocean phantom. Yet in cases where the colony is menaced by an adult reef glider, the ocean phantom has one last form of protection. It has its own personal defense team, in the form of spindle troopers. Huge sea spiders that live in chambers of the phantom rush to defend their home. They attack the adult reef glider until it backs off. The highly complex symbiosis between the spindle troopers and the ocean phantoms have modern parallels. As the documentary points out, bodyguards aren't unheard of in nature. The trapezoid crab, for example, lives among coral and protects its home from coral-eating starfish with its sharp pinchers. The ocean phantoms take this a step further, however, by also providing their spindle troopers with sustenance, produced from red algae that grows on the ocean phantom's back. Truly, these siphonophores are almost like miniature cities, floating on the vast, shallow seas. Not all regions of this high-temperature Earth are underwater, however. A vast rainforest can be found upon a rather unexpected continent. We'd know this landmass as Antarctica, but it has changed much from our era, becoming warmer and warmer as tectonic plate shifts cause the landmass to move upwards. Now near the equator, this green Antarctica has given rise to startling adaptations. Birds are the main inhabitants of this region, as they were some of the few animals able to migrate to this island continent over the millennia. But this particular species, the Spitfire bird, has a defense unlike any we'd recognize. When threatened, the Spitfire bird sprays a hot, noxious fluid from its nose. While we've never seen such a defense evolve in a bird from our time, the bombardier beetle can produce a burning, acid-like substance that can repel almost any predator. The Spitfire bird might just be the most impressive bird species of the Green Antarctic. On the nearby peaks of the Great Plateau, however, another remarkable species is waiting. The mountain range where it dwells was formed by the tectonic plates of Australia and southeastern Asia colliding, a crash that would likely result in peaks even higher than the Himalayas of today. And soaring over these peaks is a great blue windrunner. This giant bird possesses a wingspan of almost 10 feet, or 3 meters, and upon closer inspection, it actually has four wings, not just two, to help it maintain altitude. At the time of the Futures Wilds production, the concept of a bird with four wings was just speculation. After its release, however, a specimen of the Microraptor genus of dinosaur was discovered to have four wings, just like the Windrunner. While the Microraptor is of course a life form from Earth's past instead of its future, this discovery shows that such a body plan was, at some point, successful. While the Windrunners are majestic, a much less appealing species lurks in the gloom of the Great Plateau's caves. These are silver spiders, massive arachnids that have collected huge piles of grass seeds. But silver spiders are carnivores. The seeds aren't for them. Therefore, a small, shy species of rodent, the amusingly named Poggle. While the hamster-like Poggles themselves are cute, their role in this ecosystem gave me more existential dread during my childhood than pretty much anything. The documentary imagines that Poggles are, unsettlingly, 
the very last of all mammal species on Earth. And while the silver spiders allow them to eat their fill of seeds, this is because the spiders are farming the poggles. On occasion, the spiders will attack one poggle and drag it off to be eaten. It's a terrifying fate for the last mammal, and one I'm sure caused nightmares across the globe. Thankfully, it's one of the less likely hypotheticals. Mammals are highly adaptable, already having survived one mass extinction, and aren't likely to be outcompeted so thoroughly in all parts of the globe that they go completely extinct, even in a hundred million years. But a world without mammals is an interesting concept to explore as a hypothetical, which is part of the idea behind the future is wild anyway. In 200 million years into the future, we've at last reached the final era of the future is wild, which scientists imagine is home to the most unrecognizable life forms of all. This version of planet Earth now features a single supercontinent and a single global ocean, much like the bygone era of Pangaea. This is, indeed, where our tectonic plates are likely headed, and the result would be some truly extreme environments. On the edge of the coast, what seem like birds are flapping in the sky. But upon closer inspection, these aren't birds at all, but aerial fish, which the documentary amusingly calls flish. The flish are an icon of the franchise in a way, and are meant to have evolved from the gliding, flying fish of today. In 200 million years, such a life form evolving more efficient flight in lung-like organs isn't so improbable a hypothetical after all. And the air is one of the safer places to be, for in the waters of the global ocean, sharks are still patrolling. This bioluminescent species is a sharkopath, another entertaining name. Sharks surviving this far into the future with essentially the same body plan actually makes complete sense, as they've been stalking our oceans for at least 400 million years with very few changes. But the introduction of bioluminescent signals show the sharkopaths have become coordinated pack hunters, using their flashes to keep track of each other during a hunt. While the sharkopaths are deadly, however, they aren't the largest life forms in the global ocean. That distinction goes to the colossal rainbow squid. These highly intelligent life forms are another one of my childhood favorites, due to their ability to change color to ward off predators. Displays like this are also present in the cephalopods of today thanks to the power of chromatophores. These are pigment-filled sacs in the skin that can create remarkably complex colors and patterns in response to signals from the animal's brain. But the rainbow squid's chromatophores are imagined to be on another level, able to render the creature virtually invisible by matching the color of the water, or by lighting up the rainbow squid in a dazzling display to others of their kind. A squid offshoot one day conquering the sea is one thing, but on land, the future's wild has one last surprise. This perpetually damp rainforest is located on the northern portion of the era's supercontinent, and lumbering through the forest is a 16-foot, or 5-meter tall, squid. This is a mega-squid, one of the most famous and debated life forms of the future's wild. Like the Swampus, it's a cephalopod that has traded the sea for the land. But unlike the Swampus, it is now fully terrestrial. Even in 200 million years, a squid becoming an elephant-sized land dweller without a rigid skeleton seems improbable. But the documentary claims the squid supports itself using a network of circular and vertical muscles that act as a pseudoskeleton. And according to calculations done by McNeil Alexander, a late British biomechanist who worked on the project, the math actually checks out in favor of the megasquid. So the megasquid, while extremely speculative, might not be completely impossible after all, which is a preferable outcome because the concept of a giant forest-dwelling squid is amazing. And in the branches above the megasquid, the final creature of the future's wild is waiting. This is a squibbin, another type of terrestrial squid that spends its life swinging from the branches of the forest canopy. And if that isn't strange enough, the documentary imagines that navigating the three-dimensional forest has made these creatures highly intelligent. Indeed, this 200 million year journey ends with a stirring promise of human-like intelligence re-emerging through the squibbon. It's a speculative concept that is certainly unusual, but strangely compelling. 
While humans are gone forever in this future, the implication that a new civilization of intelligent squids will replace us is perhaps strangely comforting. Honestly, I could have explored this world forever. But while there wasn't enough time to cover every single life form, I hope I've shown why the future is wild was something really special. There wasn't anything like it on TV at the time, and there hasn't really been anything quite like it since. Hearing top scientists get excited about the creatures they've invented was just so wholesome, and I hope they know how much the world they created meant to people. I hear there have been plans to revive the show that have never quite materialized, and I think that's a shame. I feel like a modern remake or sequel with better effects and even more science would be really successful in the age of the internet. Maybe one day we'll get more of The Future is Wild. But in the meantime, we have the incredible original, which has stood the test of time. As always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.